seeing its launch by a month. Worldwide, it wasn't growing any faster than Minidesk, and as time went on, sales continued to decline. The economics of both formats simply didn't make sense for the majority of consumers. Compact discs were reasonably priced at about $15, but pre-recorded MDs and DCCs weren't much cheaper. Blank media for either was dramatically more expensive than cassette tapes, and as predicted, the new technologies caused consumers to become overwhelmed and apathetic. Analog cassettes were cheap, ubiquitous, and most importantly, good enough, so both newcomers suffered. Sony continued to make refinements to its format. Newer versions of the 8-track codec offered better audio quality and prices of blank media fell. The company cut prices on players and recorders and launched new marketing campaigns. Market share grew, but slowly. It was becoming obvious that pre-recorded music was going to remain only a small part of Minidisc sales. Despite continuing to court record labels, only a few hundred titles were released. Sony wanted the format to succeed worldwide, and being a giant company, it continued to throw money and resources at the technology. At the time, Philips was only slightly smaller, but unlike Sony, it also had chronic financial struggles. It had taken on some big acquisitions over the years, but they weren't proving profitable. And technologies it developed, like the V2000 video cassette, quickly found themselves beaten by rival formats. The company brought on new CEO Cor Bluestra to clean up the mess, and he found that Philips simply couldn't continue to subsidize DCC. It was clear that the format's time had run out, so in October 1996, after four tough years, DCC was quietly discontinued. Minidisc had won the format war that never was, but it was still facing an interesting dichotomy because while it was slow going in North America and Europe, there was one country where MD was king. Japan. The music industry in Japan works very differently than in the West. For a variety of reasons, purchasing copies of music has always been an expensive affair. A CD that sells for $12 in the U.S. can go for the equivalent of $30 in Japan. And while consumers in that country generally have a healthy amount of disposable income, it's still costly to collect albums. In the early 80s, music rental shops started to pop up as a way to fill this gap. You could rent music from chains like Gio, Rekodo, or Tsutaya for the equivalent of $2 a day. These stores soon became wildly popular. For the price of buying one CD, you could rent a dozen. And as one might expect, many people would make copies of the music they rented. Fearing a loss of revenue, the domestic music industry tried to get rental shops declared illegal. It lobbied the Japanese diet, but found itself going up against electronics manufacturers who had been benefiting from the increased sales of blank media and recording devices. The manufacturers were effective in their lobbying, and in 1985, the government amended Japan's copyright law in a way that ended up striking a balance between the two. Copying rented music for personal use was declared legal, but rental shops had to pay royalties to the music labels, and a fee was attached to sales of blank media. American record labels hated the arrangement, but there was little they could do about it. The way the Japanese consumed music had fundamentally shifted, whether the labels liked it or not. Because of this, Minidisc became an instant hit in Japan. Consumers found it an easy, inexpensive, and high-quality alternative to tape, just as Sony had hoped. The technology was licensed to other companies, such as Sharp, JVC, and even Matsushita, which further increased sales. And while blank MDs weren't nearly as cheap as tapes at first, they still proved to be good value over the cost of purchasing a CD. The irony of being both a leading member of the music industry, but also the manufacturer of a popular tool for piracy, 
wasn't lost on Sony. It knew what its new format would be used for. One small concession came in the form of the Serial Copy Management System, or SCMS. It placed limits on digital copies from one format to another to block multiple generations of perfect quality pirated recordings. Some governments required manufacturers of digital audio equipment to include it, like Sony's Minidisc and Philips DCC. This came about from the recording industry's battle with DAT in the United States. In Japan, the net effect was that listeners were more likely to make copies from CDs they rented themselves instead of making a third generation recording from a friend, and thus the record labels would get their cut of the licensing fees. As another way to combat rental copying in Japan, a few companies launched music kiosks in the late 90s. These were usually located in places like convenience stores and held a library of the latest singles and popular songs. You'd insert a blank mini disc and the kiosk would copy your selection to it in just a few seconds. Songs cost between 250 and 500 yen depending on how recent they were. And despite the prevalence of CD rental services, these kiosks were poised to become commonplace with one option, the music pod from V-Sync, planning to have 6,000 machines located across the country by the end of 2000. Over the years, Minidisc would become a dominant format in Japan. By 1998, sales of Minidisc players even overtook those of CD players. It may not have become the worldwide replacement for cassettes that Sony wanted, but it certainly had momentum at home. In its efforts to spur mini-disc adoption, Sony packed in as many features as it could. Players and recorders came in all sorts of form factors. The first mini-disc recorder was actually a portable unit, the Sony MZ-1. It was a bit bulky, weighing one and a half pounds, but it featured both analog and digital inputs and outputs, along with those impressive editing capabilities. It was a great showcase for the promise that the format held, but if Sony wanted Minidisc to be a true replacement for cassettes, it also needed to offer home recording decks. And over the years, it produced quite a number of them. Some home decks were simple one-disc units meant for straightforward recording and playback. They offered the full complement of editing features, but these tasks were a bit cumbersome due to their basic buttons and controls. Higher-end decks offered more features, like a PS2 port for connecting a computer keyboard to make editing and entering track names easier. There were also a range of combination units that incorporated a CD player and offered one-touch dubbing from CD to mini-disc. A few of these could even do so at high speed, two or four times faster than real-time. Boomboxes and shelf stereo systems were a logical extension for the format as well. Some shelf systems even offered features the home decks couldn't, such as the ability to set a timer to start recording from sources like radio stations. A few models offered not only a multi-CD changer, but also a multi-MD changer. This was a nod to the Japanese market, as you could load in stacks of CDs and blank mini discs, then with a button press, the system would copy them all on its own. And at least one system also featured a special input that could control a portable player for doing automatic mini-disc to mini-disc copies in the analog domain as a way to bypass the limits imposed by SCMS. A number of manufacturers also offered